Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this event of the EAG Local Chapter Netherlands. Uh, tonight we are going to talk about uh, seismic interferometry. And uh, as usual, I will give you uh, a brief uh, pre presentation uh, talking about the EAG community, the agenda of today, uh, the rules of, for using WebEx event, and then I will uh, uh, give uh, uh, the stage to our guest, uh, Dejan Draknov. Um, so, uh, as usual, I want to welcome uh, our extended community uh, made of different local chapters, uh, our friends of the uh, London, Paris, Oslo and Aberdeen local chapters, uh, as well as uh, the Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists uh, and uh, uh, the uh, special interest community of EAG, for example, the decarbonization and energy transition, and the student chapter of, Do of Delft, uh, DOCS, uh, and uh, Aachen uh, University. Uh, we are always uh, uh, looking for uh, new members, so uh, if uh, you want to contact us, we are all on LinkedIn. Uh, depending on where you are, you can contact one of uh, uh, these different local chapters. Uh, I uh, added to the list the newcomer uh, local chapter Germany uh, and also the uh, email address uh, of uh, uh, German uh, local chapter and uh, uh, together with uh, uh, other uh, local chapter as you can see in this slide. So if you're interested to join us and to help us organizing this type of events, just contact us uh, through our email. Today's agenda, so uh, the title of the talk is uh, Mineral Exploration with the Active and Passive Source Seismic Interferometry, More Data for Lower Cost and Environmental Impact. Uh, our uh, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Dejan Dragnov, uh, Associate Professor in Applied Geophysics and Petrophysics at the Department of uh, Geoscience and Engineering at UDelft. Um, the Jan will talk uh, about 30 minutes and then we will have uh, a debate and Q&A session. Uh, so if uh, uh, you have any question, as usual, please uh, uh, use the three dots on the bottom right to open the Q&A uh, box. Uh, then uh, Hannes, who is hosting the event, uh, will uh, um, uh, uh, we'll uh, unmute you, uh, we will read your question, and then we will also unmute you uh, in, in case there is a continuation of the question or you want to discuss directly with the, uh, the Jan. And uh, important thing, after the event, uh, we will unmute everybody and uh, we will keep the event uh, open uh, for uh, uh, another uh, half an hour, let's say. Uh, so if uh, you want to stay, uh, we can have a casual uh, uh, talk. Uh, about uh, uh, the topic. Uh, also, as usual, at the end, there will be a brief survey. Uh, so please uh, fill in that survey because it's helping us also to improve uh, our, our topics, our talks and our services in general. Now, uh, um, without uh, uh, further delay, I want to introduce the speaker. Uh, so, Dejan Draganov is uh, an associate professor in the section of Applied Geophysics and Petrophysics at the Department of Geoscience and Engineering at UDelft in the Netherlands. He obtained his PhD cum laude in 2007. Uh, his expertise lies in the theory and application of seismic interferometry from ultrasonics uh, through near surface and exploration to global scales. Uh, together with uh, Professor Wapner, uh, he was giving a two-day course on seismic interferometry as part of the continuing education curriculum for professionals for the SEG. Since 2004, Draganov's research has resulted in 65 published papers, one book publication, four book chapters. In 2010, uh, Draganov received the Clarence Karcher Award from the SEG and was awarded uh, uh, VENI in 2007 and VIDI in 2012, uh, personal grants from the Dutch Science Foundation and WO. From 2006 uh, till 2017, he served as uh, Associate Editor for Geophysics and from 2017 to 2019 as an Assistant Editor for Geophysics. He is a member of SCG and EAG. Please, uh, uh, Dejan, uh, we will give you the presentation uh, mode and uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you again for uh, uh, joining us tonight. Thank you, Diego. Okay, I will share now. Yes, well, this one. Yes, you see it. 
uh, and you see my screen, I suppose. Yeah, it's clear. Perfect. Okay. So, um, today I'm going to talk about mineral exploration with active and passive source, uh, seismic uh, interferometry. So, uh, obtaining more data for lower cost and lower environmental impact. Uh, I'm going to show uh, several applications, uh, actually, that uh, we <clears throat> have uh, done with colleagues. This is uh, a talk that uh, I uh, gave last year during the near surface geoscience uh, conference, and I was uh, kindly invited also by the local chapter to give a talk. So I chose to give uh, gave, uh, this one as well <clears throat> again here. So, in the following, uh, first, I'm going to uh, give you some motivation why uh, we want to uh, use the seismic method and well, seismic interferometry with the seismic method. And then I'm going to give a definition of what is seismic interferometry. And afterwards, I'm going to show uh, several examples. As I said, uh, the first ones will be three for uh, active source data, so seismic interferometry with active source data, and that will be followed uh, by two uh, <clears throat> examples of uh, seismic interferometry with uh, passive source data. All these are recorded at uh, all these data are recorded at uh, uh, <clears throat> mining uh, fields. And at the end, uh, we are going to draw conclusions. The seismic exploration method uh, has shown its uh, <clears throat> uh, really qualities of imaging uh, subsurface targets relatively deeper with high resolution, and that's why it is very popular. And it is becoming more and more popular also uh, in the mining industry. So what the seismic method is doing, most of you maybe know, but for those that uh, do not, so we are placing at the most of the case, uh, most often uh, receiver arrays at the earth, uh, surface of the earth, and then we ignite sources at different points, and then we record the reflection response of the subsurface at the receivers, and then the reflection response can look like uh, what you see here in the right panels. But uh, what you see here is actually uh, a result of acoustic uh, modeling, and that's why I said might look like this, but in uh, reality, it does not, because in reality, in the field, we'll have also surface waves. Uh, and because we don't want surface waves when we want to image, uh, to make an uh, uh, image of the subsurface with the reflection energy, then we don't want the surface waves, and then that's why we treat them as noise but it will still cover part of the reflected uh, waves. And that's why we have to do something, to try to do something to suppress the surface waves. <clears throat> uh, so that we can obtain uh, uh, images with higher resolution of the subsurface. In uh, brown mining fields, which means mining fields where already the, uh, there are uh, exploitation activities, we will have uh, working machinery, which will also make noise, uh, and that uh, noise uh, will uh, affect uh, quite a lot, especially the further offsets. So the, the data that we'll record will have a lower signal to noise ratio, and that will again lower our uh, resolution of the imaging targets. Furthermore, uh, we'll have obstacles. Uh, we will not be able uh, all the time to place the receivers where we want them uh, to be. So you see here uh, some of the sources, I mean, some of the sources are missing, which again will uh, create gaps in our uh, data and will result in lowering of the resolution of our obtained image. All these uh, shortcomings of uh, mining data are recorded in uh, <clears throat> So, uh, uh, seismic data recorded in mining fields can be uh, addressed effectively by utilization of seismic interferometry to suppress uh, the noise that we don't want, so surface waves and uh, noise from the mining activities, and create virtual sources to fill in the active source gap <clears throat> in the field. For uh, some uh, mining fields, what, for example, green fields, which means uh, where there are no exploitation activities uh, yet, so they are being uh, explored. <clears throat> but even for some brown fields, when the, the 
mining company wants to enlarge uh, their um, field of uh, exploitation. They want to make exploration to know where to uh, mine. And it might happen that they might not be able even to use active sources at all due to uh, considerations uh, for safety or environmental uh, <clears throat> considerations. So what we'll have is actually that we cannot be able to record seismic data, the active source uh, seismic data to obtain seismic image of the subsurface. And uh, in such cases, it would be nice actually to have a method that allows using subsurface sources, uh, passive sources like uh, what I'm showing here uh, as a cartoon, and then to use the, them, uh, recordings from them, uh, to apply to them seismic interferometry and to turn the result into a virtual seismic uh, reflection survey where we have uh, <clears throat> virtual sources and positions of receivers and uh, recordings from these virtual sources at our receivers. When we have such recordings, we can then apply the standard uh, seismic exploration techniques to obtain an image of the subsurface. And seismic interferometry is uh, the process of retrieval of uh, <clears throat> uh, new seismic responses between uh, receivers from uh, the correlation, uh, convolution, coherence, or deconvolution of recordings at the receivers uh, where these recordings originate uh, from surrounding sources. And when uh, the receivers that we're interested in are placed at the Earth's surface, then the theory shows that we need uh, sources only in the subsurface. If the receivers are placed in the subsurface, then we'll need sources to uh, surround the receivers from everywhere. So what seismic interferometry actually does, it turns one of the receivers into a virtual source and that allows us actually to have the recording from this virtual source at our second receiver. So in the following, I'm going to show uh, five examples, as I said, of uh, application of seismic interferometry to uh, mining data. <clears throat> and let us start with uh, active sources for suppression of surface waves. So when we have uh, active source recordings in the field, uh, we will record uh, reflections, what we are after, but also we will record surface waves, what we don't want actually, because as we saw in the cartoon at the beginning, the surface waves are covering part of the reflections. <clears throat> uh, we can apply to these recordings uh, seismic interferometry uh, to suppress the surface waves, but uh, as I will show how, I will explain. But uh, as I said, having sources at the surface does not comply with the theory which tells us that uh, the sources in this case need to be only the subsurface. Because of that, <clears throat> uh, we will have uh, normally some problems, but we can use these problems actually in a good, uh, in a yeah, advantageous way for us. When we apply seismic interferometry, we can still, uh, so by cross correlation in this case, we can still retrieve reflections uh, at uh, one of the receiver from a virtual source at another receiver, but we'll also retrieve the surface waves. And as part of the seismic interferometry, we have to sum over the sources. And because we have sources at uh, the surface, what will happen is actually that the surface waves will be relatively much stronger than the reflection arrivals. So this is not something what we want, but we can use it in an advantageous way because we can actually decide to uh, retrieve mainly the surface waves, really to make such pre-processing that we retrieve surface waves, and then to use these retrieved surface waves to adaptively, <clears throat> adaptively subtract them from the surface waves in the, or from the active data that we recorded in the field to obtain just uh, reflection, the reflection response from the active source data, the data that we recorded. And this is actually a really uh, data-driven surface wave suppression uh, method. And here I'm going to show an example how uh, well, 
the result of the application of surface wave uh, interferometric suppression. Uh, for this, uh, we used data from the Ludwika mines in Sweden, uh, where active source survey, uh, reflection survey was recorded in 2016. And here you see at the bottom uh, the obtained uh, stacked and migrated uh, sections of the subsurface, uh, only stacked in this case. Uh, you see in the left, the image of the subsurface, uh, which was obtained by suppressing the surface wave, uh, the surface waves in the active data using a standard method, which is uh, uh, frequency wave number filtering, or FK, as we uh, write it in a shorthand. Typical uh, result of uh, frequency wave number filtering is that in the result we see such uh, <clears throat> noise, such linear events, which in this case make the data look uh, laterally discontinuous. So one can actually interpret uh, these uh, reflectors as uh, being uh, uh, yeah, uh, laterally discontinuous with the discontinuity due to fault, for example. In the right uh, image, you see the result uh, with the same processing, but after interferometric surface wave suppression. And you can see that now uh, the um, lateral continuity of uh, the subsurface reflectors is uh, much better. Uh, it, it can be really appreciated. Uh, and we can now interpret uh, <clears throat> a near surface reflector, which here was not possible to interpret due to uh, the processing that was applied. And still uh, due to surface wave that were present there. So uh, by applying uh, interferometric surface wave suppression, we see that we managed to improve the imaging quality of our data. The second example that I will show is from uh, 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 from the same data uh, when we try to obtain better uh, first breaks. So first breaks, these are uh, the first arrivals that we have in our uh, reflection recordings. These are for the nearest offsets, the direct arrivals. For the further, further offsets, these are refracted waves, and we might even happen to have diving waves, depending on geometry and uh, uh, subsurface uh, structures. <clears throat> uh, so as I showed before in the previous example, uh, when we have the active source survey, we record reflections, surface waves, but we can also have uh, refracted waves in our recording. And if we apply seismic interferometry to such recordings, what uh, we will obtain using seismic interferometry by cross correlation and after summing over the sources, we will obtain actually an artifact when we correlate to refracted waves. And this artifact is called a virtual refraction and uh, it is called like this because it, uh, it is a result of correlating two refracted waves. And it is not a physical arrival because it appears to have propagated only inside part of our subsurface structures. And in this case, uh, along the <coughs> uh, boundary between the second and the third layer. So having such an arrival is something that uh, yeah, does not help us directly, or there are ways also to process it in a specific way and then use it, but we can uh, actually use it in a different way as well. Uh, if we apply seismic interferometry by cross correlation, we retrieve this arrival. And just like uh, the case with surface waves, the more uh, sources we have, the stronger this uh, retrieved arrival will be, which means that its uh, signal to noise ratio effectively is uh, increased. If we now apply as a second step seismic interferometry, uh, but by cross uh, convolution, and we convolve this virtual refraction that we see here with uh, actual refractions that we have recorded in our actual data, then uh, again, we sum, but this time we sum over the receivers that are between the source and the receiver that we have here, the virtual uh, refraction. <clears throat> and the result will be actually a physical uh, refraction that will retrieve 
But as you can see here from the thick lines, it will be characterized by a much improved signal to noise ratio. Which means that it will allow us to pick much more easily uh, uh, the first breaks, so or in this case, the refracted arrivals, even at the furthest offsets. And this method, this two step uh, seismic interferometric uh, application is called super virtual interferometry. Why? Because we obtain uh, virtual refraction, so uh, actually, which are with a very good signal to noise ratio, much improved, and that's why they're also called super virtual refractions. This, just like the previous uh, suppression of surface waves, is also a purely data driven way of improving the refractions in our recordings. And here you see an application, again, uh, as I said, uh, using the data from the Ludwika mines that was recorded there in 2016. Uh, here in the top uh, left panels, you see the field data, uh, which uh, was recorded uh, in the field uh, from the active sources. You see we have here in the near offsets uh, clear direct arrivals, which can be picked, but the further offsets, uh, especially the far offsets, we cannot really discern the, um, <clears throat> clearly the refracted arrivals. If we apply now uh, these two-step seismic interferometry, so super virtual interferometry for retrieval of uh, super virtual refractions, we obtain this result, what you see in the bottom left panels here. These are two different uh, common source gathers. And if we now combine the super virtual refractions at the intermediate and far offsets with the short offsets from the actual data, then we obtain a complete set of data. So here you see it in the right panels, which now we can use for a first break uh, picking. And why we want the first breaks to pick them? Well, for uh, example, for a refraction uh, um, statics, so for, to apply refraction tomography and then for uh, statics for static corrections. Again, you see here that uh, we have improved really a lot the quality of the data, which will also result in a better uh, velocity model for the static corrections. And uh, after suppressing the surface waves and uh, obtaining uh, better first breaks, we can actually also look at the data and try to fill in source gaps if we have such uh, source gaps in the data. If uh, we have our data with a nice regular designed uh, source array, then we will record this reflection at the first uh, receiver. But if we don't have some of the sources because of uh, obstacles, yeah, we're in a brown uh, in a brown mining field, and there are some uh, uh, obstacles there, machinery or just piles of uh, broken rock, uh, so we cannot place their sources, and then we'll have a gap, and that will lower effectively the uh, imaging quality of our data <clears throat> but if we have a receiver inside the gap so it is a bit easier to place receivers somewhere where we cannot place sources then that receiver will record a primary reflection and then it's multiples uh, at uh, another receivers and then we can apply seismic interferometry to this data seismic interferometry by cross correlation also in this case and the result will be that we will retrieve a virtual source at uh, our uh, receiver where we have the uh, source gap and then it's response to the other receivers. So in this way, we can fill in uh, the um, uh, source gaps in a data driven way again by uh, actually merging the retrieved data from seismic interferometry with the original data from uh, the active sources, the way we recorded it in the field. In principle, we can uh, retrieve complete set of virtual source data uh, at all the receivers. So uh, turning each of the receivers in turn into a virtual source and then process this data, this virtual data, complete virtual data to obtain images in the subsurface. But uh, this is not uh, that nice to do because as we saw, in the correlation so uh, process so in seismic in the seismic interferometry process we will retrieve non-physical arrivals like the virtual refraction but also other non-physical uh, arrivals these are virtual reflections or the ghost reflections what uh, we call as well which appear to propagate only inside specific layers as a result our virtual data will have physical reflections but also non-physical arrivals and it will be difficult to interpret it by uh, on its own that's why it's better 
in the field if we have active data just to use the interferometric data to fill in the source gap here. And then uh, we want to do this filling uh, actually in an optimal way, so to merge the two data sets so that uh, the data can be used as one data set for imaging purposes. And here again, I'm using as an example the data from uh, Ludvika in Sweden. <clears throat> Before applying uh, seismic interferometry for filling the source gap, we removed the surface waves uh, using surface wave suppression, what you already saw. Then we artificially created a source gap uh, along this line by just not using uh, sources along the line at certain positions, which were actually uh, next to each other. So we really create a source gap. And then we applied seismic interferometry to this data to obtain virtual sources in the, uh, at the receiver positions that are inside this source gap. And then we merge the two data sets, the original active source data and the virtual source uh, data that we obtained uh, using uh, POX, which stands for uh, projection onto convex sets. And here you see the two results, again, the stacked sections of the subsurface. You see here the result from uh, stacking the data with the source gap. So uh, we did not use uh, here a lot of sources. And you see that uh, here, of course, we cannot image part of the near surface and the subsurface reflectors, which we saw should be laterally continuous, appear even more broken than uh, before. Here in the right, you see the data, so the stacked image of the merged data set, so the active data plus the virtual source uh, data. And uh, despite that the virtual source data has a lower signal to noise ratio, we can now appreciate the lateral continuity of the reflectors. So here we can actually interpret that the reflectors are uh, most likely continuous laterally, which cannot be said for this image. Furthermore, here actually we can start interpreting that there where is the shallow reflector, which we saw also in the first example that exists there. So again, applying seismic interferometry in this case for obtaining active, uh, so virtual sources in a source gap and merging the data sets, we improved the imaging quality of our data. And we saw how we can uh, yeah, use uh, seismic interferometry to fill in a source gap, but what will happen if we don't have active sources at all? It, it might happen that we cannot use them due to technical, uh, financial, or even environmental uh, restrictions. Well, in this case, uh, we want to use passive sources in the subsurface uh, to actually turn our receivers into virtual sources and in this way to retrieve virtual uh, reflections uh, at our receivers. And such sources can be, for example, the ambient noise, uh, subsurface mining activity uh, for active mines, local seismicity for certain parts of the world at least, and other uh, sources. <clears throat> uh, if we uh, have the recordings from the ambient, soils, uh, ambient uh, noise, so we, how we do it, we just place receivers uh, at the surface, we record the noise, and then apply seismic interferometry to it. We saw, uh, or I already said, that if we have uh, sources at the surface, we will retrieve strong surface waves. The same is also uh, the case if we have sources relatively close to the surface. They will mainly contribute to retrieval of surface waves. While if we have sources relatively deeper in the subsurface, then they will retrieve mainly for retrieval of reflections. So if we are targeting uh, to image the subsurface structures with uh, reflection arrivals, then it is uh, a good idea not to use all the recorded noise but to separate the noise into um, uh, noise panels uh, or pieces uh, of the recordings, short times windows that are uh, uh, dominated by uh, sources of uh, surface waves and others that are dominated by sources of body waves, which can, so uh, from here, which can retrieve uh, reflections. And this uh, can be done by effectively by um, uh, automatic illumination uh, diagnosis. <clears throat> and here I'm showing exactly such a 
<coughs> example where this time we used another data set from uh, Finland, from the Kililahti active mine, uh, which uh, was instrumented at the surface with a large N array. So the black and white dots, what you see here, which recorded about 600 hours of uh, noise continuously over uh, this active mine. And uh, uh, we used actually illumination diagnosis to uh, see if to, uh, through this noise to separate it into uh, parts of the noise that are dominated by surface waves and parts of the noise where we have uh, at least uh, recognizable uh, body wave arrivals, which with interferometry will be turned into reflections. Here you see the subsurface model that is done using all the data available uh, <clears throat> in the mine uh, below line seven, this one. And we use this model to generate uh, 2D uh, seismic, uh, to simulate 2D seismic data, active source data, so that we can apply it with uh, staking and migration to obtain such an image of the subsurface to see what is the best possible image that we can expect using active sources at the surface. What we want to uh, obtain using our passive data to turn our receivers into virtual sources. So this is our best case scenario. If we have uh, active sources at all our receivers, what we can image. As you can see, this is uh, di different from uh, layered subsurface, uh, what we are more used to, and we can image only parts of the structures. So uh, we use the passive data and apply to its seismic interferometry, but we applied it only to one hour of uh, these 600 hours of noise, which was selected to have uh, really good body wave arrivals in it. <clears throat> and we applied seismic interferometry also by another method, by multidimensional deconvolution. And here you, you see the image of the subsurface obtained in exactly the same way as the image from the simulated uh, data. Uh, this data, simulated data, we can use it also to evaluate how good are our results from the really passive field data. And we can see, comparing the two images, that uh, we can uh, indeed interpret uh, parts of the structures that we expect to have been imaged, uh, this one especially, and this one for uh, line 7. And we did it also for line 8 and 9 to see in 3D if we can uh, do such an imaging, and we see again that uh, we can interpret really nicely uh, these uh, parts of the bodies which we expect to uh, be imaged. And the final application is uh, yeah, going a step further instead of uh, uh, going through all the noise and evaluating it and separating parts which are uh, dominated by surface waves and others which are dominated by useful noise or body wave noise, then we can actually use directly the local seismicity if available from another study, for example, or we can ourselves uh, also detect events, so micro seismic events, and then use them for uh, micro earthquakes, or not that micro, they might be also big, also good, at least for imaging. So, uh, <clears throat> as I said, if we have sources in the subsurface, we can apply seismic interferometry to them to turn our uh, receivers at the surface into virtual sources. And if sources are also close to the surface, we'll retrieve surface waves. If the sources are uh, deeper, we'll retrieve mainly reflections. Well, we can use this principle and choose really sources that are uh, close to vertically positioned below the receivers, so subvertically. And this means that we'll not be retrieving uh, oh, sorry, uh, surface waves at all. We'll directly be having only reflection arrivals, which is a good thing because anyway we don't want the surface waves for reflection imaging and we can even do uh, another step to actually use seismic interferometry by autocorrelation and directly this will allow us to directly retrieve zero offset uh, traces something that actually we wanted to uh, obtain and this is what we obtained in the previous examples by doing stacking here we obtain it directly uh, just as a output from seismic interferometry this is exactly what we did, uh, apply seismic interferometry by autocorrelation to uh, micro earthquakes uh, that were recorded at the Herolekas bauxite mining uh, area in central Greece. 
uh, the we used their um, <clears throat> the seismic array, uh, which uh, from passive standalone stations, they are indicated here by the black triangles in 2D and in 3D. Uh, the recordings uh, were about four months long, and they allowed uh, recording about uh, 3,000 micro earthquakes, which were uh, detected and uh, located. And you see here in this map their uh, epicentra and here their hypocentra. From these 3,000 uh, micro earthquakes, uh, we actually selected uh, 953 that uh, will be very useful for seismic interferometry by autocorrelation. And the selected micro earthquakes, <clears throat> which uh, were with um, magnitudes between minus 1.5 and uh, plus 2. Uh, had to comply with the requirements uh, to have their epicentral distance from the nearest stations, uh, from the nearest station, not uh, longer than five kilometers, what you see here. And then for each station, we choose the earthquakes, which are uh, within five kilometers epicentral distance from it, and we apply to them autocorrelation. To retrieve zero offset traces, what you see here, given in black. And then this is the result that we can directly use for uh, imaging and interpretation. In this case, we also uh, applied time to depth conversion. So you see here, actually, this is depth now. And for that, we used a velocity model, which was obtained from earthquake tomography, which is also given here with the colors. And as you can see from uh, the traces, uh, the resolution is really good uh, and it allowed us allow allowed us to really interpret uh, with high resolution where is the boundary between the two formations uh, between which the bauxite is uh, found. And this is really this was really important and very uh, useful to the mining company. They were very happy to see this result, uh, which is given here by the broken red line because they didn't know exactly where the boundary between the two formations uh, was. So now they can actually extend their <clears throat> mining activities. And this brings me to the conclusions. Uh, we saw that active and passive source applications of seismic interferometry can be very useful for uh, mining exploration in both uh, brown and green fields. Active source seismic interferometry can be used to uh, obtain improved uh, data quality <clears throat> and uh, imaging of uh, subsurface targets, especially relatively deeper. And relatively deeper for mining means uh, below uh, 500 or 800 meters. <clears throat> and this can be done in a data-driven way by uh, surface wave suppression using retrieved surface waves, uh, improved uh, arri first arrival picking using uh, super virtual refractions, and filling in uh, source gaps with uh, virtual sources. Passive source seismic interferometry is an environmentally friendly exploration with minimum uh, footprint. And we saw that using ambient noise and or uh, micro earthquakes, so we can directly use the noise with the micro earthquakes in it, or only concentrate on the micro earthquakes, uh, allows uh, imaging of uh, mining targets with sufficient resolution, with uh, where active sources cannot uh, even be used. Well, thank you for your attention. That was uh, my presentation. I can stop sharing, maybe. Thank you, uh, Dejan. This was really an uh, interesting and very informative uh, presentation. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, now we are going to the Q&A session. So uh, we will collect some questions from the audience, if any, and uh, we will uh, read them to you. Okay. Um, maybe I will ask uh, Florencia or uh, Hannes uh, if you got some questions from the audience. It's always uh, fascinating, at least uh, for me, it's always fascinating to see some uh, results with the uh, passive sources. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. Yes, it's really nice. Uh, we have other results also from another mine in uh, Finland. But uh, this specific result that I showed from uh, uh, Greece was really exceptional. Uh, and. Uh, 
and also velocity model derived with passive seismic. Exactly. And, uh, and that, so that was the best uh, part of it that actually from the passive sources, you can end up with velocity of model and image. And uh, actually we have the result also for S waves. So uh, these, were, these were the P waves only. Uh, and then one can already do a VPVS, uh, which also can be derived from the earthquake themselves, from earthquake topography, but then higher resolution from seismic interferometry as well. I see there are, there are some questions. It's a common question from Juan Jimenez that says, "We what software could I do tomography analysis like the ones in the final slides? Uh, sorry, what? Uh, With what um, tomography software could I do uh, So the, the, yeah, uh, I yeah. understand. Thank you, Florencia. The tomography was done with uh, software uh, that uh, the company Seismotech has, so well, they did it as part of uh, the Smart Exploration project, but they, their software is based on an open source, or actually not open source, but published uh, algorithms. Uh, you can find uh, that in the article, let me see, I'll share again, uh, share. Uh, yes, so here, if I go back, so you can find a reference to those um, algorithms in uh, this reference. Yes, I, thank you, okay. Diane. I don't know if um, that answer Juan's uh, yeah, I wanted to ask that. Uh... Entirely. Yes, thank you, he said. Mm -hmm. well, we have another question from Sara Minicini, which is the magnitude range of the earthquakes in the last example you showed? Uh, so the earthquake range here actually for all 3000 is between one point, minus 1 1.5 and 2. And in Greece, that's uh, easy to have. Uh, as you can see, uh, this was just four months of uh, data and uh, that many useful events, uh, which was really nice. In the Netherlands, it will not be that easy to have such a beautiful data set. Actually, one will need to have a lot of years. And the problem in the Netherlands also, for example, will be the heavy traffic that is everywhere present. This uh, place is uh, mountainous. So actually there, there, there has been only one active survey a long time ago, 2D, and not exactly at this place where the mining companies was interested, the mining company was interested to have an image because they just cannot use active sources there. It's really difficult terrain. So they used uh, years ago uh, vibrators along the, tra the roads here, but yeah, they were interested really uh, at this place where you cannot access it with uh, vibrators. Then you have to resort to something else like uh, dynamite, but that's not easy either. And of course it is damaging. So uh, yeah, actually I took more time to answer, but to come yeah. back, so uh, between minus 1.5 and two uh, local uh, magnitudes. Yes, thank you. We have um, another question from Eric for school. For active land seismic data, we clearly see the effect of near surface condition on the strength of the surface multiples. Seismic interferometry relies on surface multiples. Do you observe similar variations on success of seismic interferometry? Is there a way to take near surface effects into account to enforce surface multiples for seismic interferometry? Um, to be honest, we haven't uh, tried yet to, to enhance the, the multiples. We just uh, let seismic interferometry uh, work on that. So uh, when you cross correlate and the longer the data, the more multiples are there and they correlate with each other. So they strengthen the retrieved uh, primary. But it is true, if there are no multiples, there will be nothing. So uh, we depend on that to have some uh, multiple scattering. And if the uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, intrinsic losses, especially in the near surface, are very, very strong, then uh, they will be uh, the surface multiples will be 
very quickly going under the normal uh, signal to noise ratio and then they will not be uh, useful. Uh, so that's a good question. We can think of uh, trying to improve the uh, surface multiples <laughs> instead of uh, suppressing them. I just want to remind that uh, uh, Hannes is unmuting uh, the, the person that is making the question. So if uh, you want to interact, Eric, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, he's unmuted, yes. Okay. Okay. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Yeah, no, so uh, I have nothing uh, much to add. I think the answer is uh, satisfactory. Uh, thanks, by the way, for a really nice presentation. Yeah, but it just triggered my mind. So uh, can we, in one way or another, uh, maybe enforce multiples uh, so that they can still contribute? Uh, like, uh, Yeah, I never, I never thought about they... this myself. So now that you say it, I also have to think. I never thought about it. Well, I mean, of course, I've, I've, I've worked with land data uh, in active mode, and there you can clearly see uh, huge variations in some areas have very strong surface multiples, other areas don't have them, but the energy should be somewhere. So if you could, in one way or another, kind of deconvolve the data to enforce maybe uh, the, the filter effect of the near surface or, or correct for that, maybe there's a way still to get more out of the data. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that could be, that could be. I uh, agree, I have seen it also, we have seen it actually also with Florencia for active data that you see that at some parts of the data you retrieve reflections, at others not. Um, yeah. Or their signal to noise ratio is so low that uh, they are not that useful at all. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think, indeed, uh, because of this effect that you uh, say. Yeah, yeah. Thank for okay. This. okay, thanks. Maybe uh, food for thought. Yeah, indeed. Good. Yes, we don't have any more questions uh, for the moment. Okay. Well, um, I think uh, I have uh, maybe a question. Uh, so I think a critical part of this method is uh, cutting the piece of signal that you're going to correlate with the others, right? Or convolve uh, to produce uh, from your virtual source uh, to the receiver. So, uh, because it depends where you're doing, what you're really uh, taking into your, uh, uh, in, in your signal can change and modify the, the, the result uh, a lot. So, do you have any comments about this? Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I, due to time, I did not go into that, but uh, now I will share my screen again. Uh, Yes, so we are here and that's clear. You're absolutely right that it is very important to be picky with your data. So here we were picky by choosing surface waves or body waves in the noise. So again, not correlating all the noise, correlating the complete noise is typical for a global uh, applications. So on the se seismological scale for retrieval of surface waves and then surface waves are retrieved because they dominate everything. So when you start cutting the noise already here, into surface waves and body waves, then you start bringing more easily forward the reflections. But as I saw uh, uh, showed here in the part with the virtual refractions, uh, here, this is the input for retrieving the refractions, the virtual, the super virtual refractions. If we have all the data, we can also do it, but then, of course, correlation is correlation. It correlates everything with everything. It's a mathematical process. So things that are somewhere deep can actually also come above our target signal and interfere with it. And then uh, it will lower our signal to noise ratio. That's why it is better to, again, also here be picking before correlation or convolution in this case, just to uh, top mute and bottom mute the data to keep only arrivals where we expect to have the useful signal. And here we don't see where the refractions are, but we expect them there, so we use, keep this part. And I guess this is the critical part because uh, I think uh, depending on where, uh, where you're doing it, uh, you get uh, different results. And if your survey is, uh, is quite big, Maybe you cannot do it manually, so you have to come up with some automatic algorithms to do that. Uh, exactly. So I guess it's quite critical, right? Exactly. This part. So, uh, indeed, I fully agree with that. And uh, for a big survey, especially 3D, uh, 
uh, yeah, if we have a PhD student, like in this case, to uh, go through the data and do it, it's great. They can do it by hand, but uh, it's not always feasible. So uh, a step forward here is to develop our automatic algorithms for this. And for such an application, it is not that difficult at all. Yeah. Uh, for the other application, the first one with the surface waves as well, and there it's even easier. Uh, so here it's also important, as I said, let me show it here with animation. So I said that we want to actually use the strong surface waves without the reflections in them. And for this, uh, very simple and very effective step is just, uh, frequency filtering. Normally we also try to do it if we are lucky with a reflection data to filter just with, uh, frequency filtering the surface waves. Normally it does not work. But here we can just apply it and then in this way, but uh, now we do uh, low pass instead of uh, low cut. Mm -hmm. And then we throw away a lot of reflection energy. Still some is kept, but due to seismic interferometry, it will be nearly negligible in the retrieved result. So it will be actually like this. And here it's very, this frequency filtering, for example, is very easy to be automated. And maybe there is uh, there is also some part that uh, where uh, machine learning could uh, have a contribution in, uh, in the automation uh, techniques. Uh, maybe definitely that uh, is something that we applied uh, at the end with a tweet. So let me come quickly here. So this part. So uh, the illumination diagnosis here it had also a part which actually that was. Uh, uh, that used machine learning, in this case, simple, but robust uh, support vector machine for selecting which parts are dominated by surface waves and which parts okay. are dominated by uh, body waves. Okay, makes sense, yes. We have, okay. another, we have another question from Femke for Supel. Oh, okay. good. Um, she's not sure if Dion maybe already gave the answer, but the distribution of micro earthquakes in the example of Greece is not homogeneous. How does this affect the result? Uh, let me go to this one. You're absolutely correct. Uh, I did not give the answer and uh, it is, you're also correct. It is very inhomogeneous. The <clears throat> problem solving here is in this part where you again are very selective with what you use for your uh, cross co autocorrelation input in this case. So you, for a station that is here, you use only earthquakes that are uh, close by in this uh, uh, epicentral distance of five kilometers from the earthquake. And then the more sources you have, which means the more earthquakes, then the stronger the result. Uh, but this you compensate by normalizing the retrieved result by the number of earthquakes, for example or just a standard normal uh, maximum normalization. And then you take care of the different number of earthquakes that are uh, contributing to the retrieval uh, of the zero offset reflections at each uh, station. Yeah, thanks, uh, Diane. And, but then aren't there any parts of the domain that are not illuminated? Uh, that can happen. Uh, yeah. I was coming to that indeed. Uh, it can happen that that means that it just precludes, for example, a station of, st of a station being used. Yeah. Uh, for example, this station, if it does not have earthquakes close to it in a uh, within five kilometers epicentral distance, then you cannot use this station with this specific uh, application. Then you have to go for cross correlation and then uh, uh, offset between the virtual source and the receiver. But yes, so it limits the number of useful stations. And would it then be possible to combine it with some active source? Um, is that something you would consider? Because I can imagine as the, the operator, they would probably like to have the entire region being mapped. Yes, um, uh, if source, active sources are there, th there was zero active sources there. They just cannot use them. So uh, okay. all, the only parts were so a few roads here, and there is where, where you uh, can access. Yes, where they used, uh, they made, uh, I don't know when was it in the end of 90s, an active uh, uh, source survey, but that was a part of the area that is not uh, really interesting uh, for the mining company uh, at all. 
Actually, okay, so you would almost yeah. hope for more natural seismicity in order to better <laughs> In this case, yes. Yeah. Anyway, very nice presentation, Leanne. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any other question, Hannes and Florencia? I don't see any. Me neither. No. Okay, so I'll try to uh, stop my sharing for the last time. Then okay. I will take uh, the presentation. Uh, okay. I think I can just wrap up. Uh, share my screen again. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Okay, now it should be correct. So let's go to the uh, final part, which is the acknowledgement. Uh, I want to thank you again, Dejan, for uh, the interesting talk. Uh, and, thank you uh, for inviting me. <laughs> I will thank you, as usual, Aramco, for providing the WebEx event platform, uh, all the local chapter of Aberdeen, Germany, London, Netherlands, Oslo, Paris, and uh, OSCG for their uh, uh, attendance and the student chapters as well. And uh, uh, anybody else in the audience, thank you again for uh, your participation. Uh, we will stop recording now, but uh, uh, we are going to stay online a little bit more. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, to stay, interact and socialize a little bit, uh, you're uh, uh, more than welcome. So Hannes.